Hi, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of With Sonar. I'm Luke, I'm hosting your show, and I am gonna be uh, treated with a very new guest on our show for With Sonar. Um, and we're gonna be diving in today to Sonar to look at everything that is going on in the freight economy so you can make smarter, better decisions. But first, let me give it up for my guest, Brian Bowling. How are you? I'm good, man. Thank you, you so much well? for having me on. Absolutely. Thanks for joining me here. Now, we're going to talk a little bit here. We're going to get your background. But before we do that, mug of the week here, I just want to talk about this here for a second. So this is from our friends over at Volta Logistics. And by the way, can I just say, this mug, which I don't even know what this is. It's a Yeti. It's cool. It's slick. Thank you so much for this, by the way. It's absolutely beautiful. Um, absolutely stunning. Now, you know these guys over here at Volta. You've been talking to them about Sonar, right? I have. I've actually known the Volta team for about four years. I'm, I'm repping their uh, fleece pullover. They're so kind to send me a while back. Okay. Uh, outstanding company, very knowledgeable. Any mode of transportation you're running, any equipment type, particularly anything over dimensional. Um, so awesome that's 3PL? Guys. 3PL, yeah, okay. based out of uh, Minnesota, Minneapolis. They got a couple offices now, opening a third one, as I understand. So growing. Um, yeah, I can't say enough good things about them and their performance. Awesome, good stuff. Well, thank you again for the mug, uh, Volta. Wish you guys the best. We're just going to leave that there, and uh, it is a very, very great looking mug. So, just to, uh, before we even go any further, too, can we take a minute? Look at this backdrop that we got going on. This is brand new. I love it. It makes us look a lot cooler than we actually are. It very much so. No, so absolutely outstanding. Very cool. Thank you to the team that did that. That was amazing. Um, now, Brian, give us a little yep. bit of your background. Um, I know I've been here at Freightways a little bit. I sell sonar, but tell tell the folks here listening who don't know much about you what your background is, how you got into the industry, and then what you do here at Freightways. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I'm also a sonar sales executive, similar to yourself. Uh, I cut my teeth in the industry initially working for a freight forwarder in the OCC, another local Chattanooga-based company, Steam Logistics. Uh, got hired on to help manage full container imports for some large furniture manufacturers and porters. Uh, uh, and slowly transitioned to doing uh, uh, domestic oceans, so anything Jones Act, subject to you know Guam, Hawaii, Alaska, uh, Puerto Rico, managing a lot of that, break bulk and row row as well. Uh, and then transitioned from from that company to uh, a domestic 3PL here called Trident Transport, uh, and worked there uh, primarily doing van freight. And then my book of business developed over time as it does, and worked yeah. with a lot of open deck shippers as well. And did that for a few years prior to. Uh, joining the Freight Waves team. Awesome, good stuff. So, what? Have, so here at Freight Waves, you know, we, we're obviously more of like a we, we're a media company, we're a data and software company. Um, we 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 measure so many different pieces of the freight market. What? Um, the, I never worked in international freight. I never did freight forwarding. I never did sure. any of that stuff. And I, I think that's a little bit more of a niche, although a ton of freight has moved over the ocean and air, a massive amount. Yeah. But I think you, you always hear about all these three PLs that everybody does over the road, transportation. But how, how does having that experience, do you think, help you when you're talking to customers about sonar? So I think what's really cool about sonar and looking at international versus domestic is that having that little bit of background allows you to kind of f flesh out the narrative of freight, right? Because so much, like to your point, so much of it starts overseas and ends up at your, your local store or supermarket or Amazon DC or, sure. or wherever. So I think having that background just allows me to kind of explain that story via sonar because sonar is designed to do that, right? And that's right. our kind of our long-term roadmap of, you know, how does one thing um, you know, the obvious example, coronavirus or any other thing happening in the Far East or, or anywhere for that matter where we import a lot from, how does that affect your domestic supply chain? So it's just, um, it, it just, I think it allows me to have a more holistic view of the data and those conversations I can have with BCOs, you know, shippers. Uh, Draymond and so on and so forth. Right. It just allows me to speak a little bit more to that from personal experience. And of course, having that shared experience goes a long way in a, in a good conversation. Yeah, no, absolutely. So how much of our, it, 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 how much of our freight that is domestic over the road in the United States gets 
is, is maybe influenced from what's being imported or exported? That's a great question. I've heard, uh, you know, as much as 80% of freight that moves over the road at some point had something or some component of it came yeah. from overseas. Wow, that much. Um, it's a lot. That yeah, a it's lot. a tremendous amount. You know, and, and value, high valuable commodities maybe doesn't make, you know, onto the water, like electronics and such. Sure. A lot of that still comes via air freight. Yeah. You know, I think it's 1% of the total volume, I think, is the number, yeah. but it's 30% of the total value that, that comes from overseas. Yeah, I've heard those numbers. So it's really interesting to see how much, um, like, the, the the amount of freight that's moved over air is not much. Like you said, about 1%, yes, but it's 30%. Small. I've even heard as much as 35% in some cases um, of the value, which means it's really, really high dollar freight. I mean, you talk medical equipment, oh, yeah. um, electronics, consumer electronics, like iPhones, Samsung devices, all that kind of stuff, game consoles, um, mm -hmm. emergency relief, a lot of that stuff yep. that has to move very quickly. So interesting to see. Awesome, good stuff. Well, thank you for your background. Yeah, um, man. Appreciate that. <clears throat> so we're going to be diving in today a little bit more about sonar, and I know there's, there's it's before we dive into sonar because we're going to look a lot about where the freight market has moved and what it, what the outlook I think will be for 2020. And obviously, it's hard to kind of pinpoint exactly, but there's some things that are happening that I think are are interesting to look at. Um, but 2019 was a hard year for yes. a lot of people in transportation. Very hard. Um, rates were down quite a bit. Um, do you think it was harder for carriers, brokers, shippers? I think, uh, well, shippers have the benefit, right? When sure. typically when, you know, volumes are, you know, volumes up, capacity is loose, shippers kind of have the reins of the, of the, you know, yeah. Uh, so to speak. So harder definitely for carriers. They already operate with a really high operational ratio, right? It's it's a slim margin industry. So it, it's difficult because they've got to go low to get the freight and keep their trucks loaded because obviously, you know, asset utilization is a huge issue for them. If their trucks aren't loaded, there's no revenue coming in and their expenses didn't really change. Yeah. So uh, I think shippers enjoyed a pretty healthy year, uh, at least from the conversations that I've had. That seems to be the case, you know, well under budget. And especially there's a lot of perception in there with the 2018 backdrop. You know, how, you know, 2018 was a difficult year for shippers, great year for a lot of carriers who some may have overextended themselves, trying to ride the roller coaster sure. a little bit too much. Um, but there's a lot of that too, because you were thinking back, you know, short term memory, it wasn't that long ago where everybody was doing really well from a brokerage or carrier perspective. But uh, I think brokers seem to weather the storm a little bit more effectively than yeah. carriers do, just because they have the benefit of looking at the freight both ways as carrier and shipper. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was a down year, it was difficult for sure. Yeah. So we, we've been looking at a few different things, and I think for, for, you mentioned a good point, I think brokers do tend to be able to weather the storm a little bit easier, where at least in these down times when rates are continuously being suppressed, which we're gonna look at here in a minute, there's, I think it hits brokers later. When rates start to get suppressed, they can push carrier rates down because carriers need to keep their trucks moving. They need the volume, exactly. they need the volume, right? Um, but eventually, if the carrier rates are suppressed for too long, they'll start to push back on brokers, which I think we've begun to see a little bit. So now brokers are beginning to be pushed from both ends and we're starting to see margins slip a little bit in the mm -hmm. industry. Um, yeah. Still a little early to tell. Yeah, it, it is. I, I actually had a conversation with a CFO of a, a pretty good size, 3PL, uh, a week or so ago. They're $60, $70 million company, pretty good size company. Sure. And, uh, you know, January, from what he told me, was a, was a difficult month because of that compression, like to your point, both sides of things. So February has already started to pick up. We're, okay. we're, we're not quite halfway. We're close to halfway through the month. So there's some optimism from his side, but... Yeah, there's certainly been some of that compression. I think December was was a difficult month because of the, the dates of the holidays. Falling on a Wednesday is not ideal, of course, Absolutely. for anybody. So, uh, but yeah, I think things are starting to look up. And I know we're going to get into sonar here in a second and look yeah. over some charts to Absolutely. reflect that. No, I think that's a really good transition. So I'm going to jump here into sonar. And um, we'll, we'll go ahead and, and put this on the screen for you guys at home to see. But there's some really, really interesting things that we're going to take a look at here. So, and we're gonna go ahead and expand this chart for you here for optimal viewing purposes. But 
what I want everyone to take a look at is I think when, when things are down, when folks are making less money, they think there's, there's just less freight to go around. I think that's the perception at least. Sure. Um, but that's not actually true. So look at this, what this chart is that we've got up here on the screen. So the blue line is the dry van volume levels in the United States over the last year. And you'll see it represented as a percentage there. So you'll see my cursor here. You see this 2% right here? That right there represents from this time last year, there has been a 2% increase in volume levels for dry van freight, meaning there are more loads to move, brokers have more loads to move, shippers are moving more freight, carriers have more opportunities to keep their wheels moving for dry van freight. Sure. Now this green line here is very interesting to me. And this represents reefer volume levels, truckload volume levels in the United States over the last year. So you see that 8%, that means from this time last year, there's a full 8% increase in reefer volume levels from this time last year. That seems pretty big to me. Yeah, absolutely. I think anything, you know, over three, 4% on a national scale is really something to raise your eyebrows and, and really take note oh, of. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I remember looking at this and we've seen, we've seen, uh, I've seen markets that have seen over a hundred percent increase, in just individual markets. Wow. I was looking at the uh, Pendleton, Oregon market and last month, and that market saw almost 150% increase in reefer volume levels from this time last year. Um, do you, how much, how much do you think a freeze protect has to affect that. As, as the temperature drops, do you think that's really gonna drive that reefer volume up a lot more? I, I think it certainly will in some markets. You know, when you when you get that frost line, when you're looking on a map, it, it definitely goes up. And then the seasonalities are funny too, because sure. some of the commodities don't necessarily have to be fully freeze protected, right? Or even a vented van can can suffice as seasons change. So it, it certainly can do that. I think you see some of that volume shift from the below the frost line on uh, on up. Now, does it does it play fully into that full eight percent? I'm not sure. I think looking at a seasonality line over the last yeah. couple of years could really inform that, which is something obviously we can do in Sonar as well. I don't Absolutely. know if we will right now, but. No, I think we can definitely take a look. Something too, we're gonna, we're gonna jump out of volume levels for just a moment. We're gonna come back to those because those are very important. But looking here, this next chart you'll see here, these are the tender rejections. So tender rejections, as you know, measure the actual percentage that carriers are rejecting their contracted freight. So what that means for folks that are new and aren't familiar with that term is as tender rejections go up, carriers are less reliant on their contracted freight to get paid or keep their wheels moving because the spot market is very healthy and they right. can make more money there. Um, as tender rejections go down, that means that the spot market is less healthy, there's less freight, it's less optimal for ch to take that freight and they rely on their contracted freight to keep the wheels moving and pay the bills. What that does for shippers is when contracted freight is higher, or excuse me, when rejections are higher, it's harder for them to cover their freight at their desired rates. And when it's lower, it's easier for them in, in return saving them money. So this chart right here is a perfect example of that. You see the blue line? That is dry van tender rejections in the United States over the last year. Again, looking at a percent. So we saw in the last chart, there was a 2% increase year over year in the dry van volumes. But this negative 31%, that's been a 31% decrease in tender rejections, meaning carriers are taking their contracted freight 31% more, because it's, it's down. I mean, that's, that's gonna suppress rates. And the purple line is reefer tender rejections. So those are down 43%. I mean, help me understand here, Brian. So this right here, means that rates are down, but there's more volume. I mean. I, yeah, I think what we're looking at is, uh, it's probably a couple of different things. I don't wanna say it's any one silver bullet, sure. so to speak, but when you've had such a, a difficult years as as uh, as we just had in 2019, part of me wants to say that it's often, it's a result of guys just saying, we gotta get what we can get right now. I think there's a yeah. survival instinct for a lot of carriers right now, just we, we can only operate at these, you know, these high ratios for so long. So I think it's a combination of, you know, holidays are, are, are through. There's there's fear about international supply chain 
everything's been disrupted for long periods of time. So I think a lot of guys are just trying to get whatever they can get yeah. I mean, on a large, large scale. So volume's up, fantastic. That's great for everybody. You know, rejections are down. I think guys are just willing to, you know, be leaner for a little while longer until we get through the winter months. At least that's my initial perception of things. Sure. I think you made a good point. There's no silver bullet. There's no perfect answer to all this stuff. Right. At the end of the day, the data doesn't lie. It is what it is. We can we can guess to what's influencing it. How can how do you think someone, either a carrier or broker, how could somebody take advantage of this situation? Is there any way to turn this into a positive, given you know the current state of the rejections and the volume? Yeah, I, I think it's huge. When you're looking at rejections, right? That's a sentiment towards the contracted market, which is the overwhelming majority of freight moved, right? I mean yeah. the. It's, it's incomparable, really. So as you're getting ready maybe to work on RFQs or RFPs or in your sales cycle right now, and you're trying to create new relationships and increase maybe customer acquisition or even strengthen existing relationships, which I am a huge advocate for, especially with Sonar, um, now's the time where we can really get in the door and, and just so like, look, rates are low right now and, and you can get in there appropriately and start developing those relationships. You know, give me your worst lane right now give me a difficult load or historically difficult scenario for you guys or what you know what's your worst lane you're running yeah now's the time where you can get in there at, at a good rate for sure and 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 hold that for I mean for the foreseeable future for sure absolutely absolutely no I, I think that I think you made a really good point too and, and something I would add is um, just to you might even be able to buy some market share too with this just kind of going on top I mean absolutely if you're, I mean, at some point, look, rates can only go so low, right? I mean, carriers have operating costs to maintain. They have to pay the bills. So if you can get in and collect a lot of market share since volumes are up or rates are down, buy a lot of that from shippers, you might have a, an opportunity to then really you know, profit from that when the pendulum swings. Because freight's cyclical, right? Absolutely, yeah. It, it's seasonal like anything else is. Right. It's seasonal is the weather. So, yeah, I think it's a huge point. Um, you know, increasing market share either through already existing relationships or, or, or you know, starting new relationships. So, uh, absolutely, I think it's a huge point to be made. Sure. Now, Brian, in your experience, I know you've been talking with folks, you've been selling Sonar to different customers. Is there a is there a favorite data set that they look at? Obviously, there, there's a ton of different ones. There's no one perfect data set. You should never look at something by itself, but is there one that they they lean on the most in your, in your conversations? I think, as I understand from talking with other people on the floor, um, intended rejections overall is hands down the thing people look to the most since it's 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 sentiment it's spot market activity but beyond, beyond that people are wanting to right mitigate or limit their spot market exposure so by knowing where things are moving that can help you from a shipper's perspective how do we need to manipulate our tender lead time you know maybe we need to take an option that seems a little pricier than what we're used to but at least we know now if we take this it's likely to prevent us from further exposure um, I think that's a universal data set that everybody from their own perspective can, can sure. really take advantage of. Um, yeah. I, no, I, I think there's a lot of truth that I've heard. You know, rejections are, are super popular with a lot of folks because, um, uh, you know, I, when, when I worked in brokerage, it was, I, I pretty much just lived in the spot market world. I didn't do a lot outside of that. Right. right. I didn't, I didn't, I did not move contracted freight. I didn't. Um, it, it was pretty much, I think, 95% of everything I moved was spot. Um, that's how the, I worked with mostly small to mid-sized shippers, and that was how they ran their business. But that's that's not the largest piece of the pie, right? Most no. freight is contracted, correct? Absolutely. It's significantly more, uh, several times more, is moved on the contract market. Sure. I, I've heard that. So in, in the trucking industry, we're, we're sitting at roughly... 700 to 800 billion dollars mm -hmm. a year, depending on what source you use in the industry. Some of that's LTL, some of that's dedicated, the yep. private fleets. We take that out, we're looking at about 500 or so billion, plus or minus, in terms of the mm -hmm. four higher truckload market. Yep. And about 400 of that is contract, and about 100 of that is spot. Yep. That's a big gap. Yes, huge gap. So is that something, so when we're measuring these tender rejections, 
It's is it is it only useful since it's mostly contract? Is it only useful for contracted carriers, or can people who move in the spot market you, be benefit as well? Oh, it's it's useful for everyone because you know there is no spot market without a contract market, right? Sure. Because the things that. Well, I should clarify. Some stuff lives in the spot market. Some freight does, right? Right. Uh, a lot of uh, open deck freight is that way. Uh, you know, they're they're not as big on tendering their information electronically for for obvious reasons. It's a more complicated uh, mode of transportation. But I mean, if you know, if you're a contract carrier, yeah, and you can better educate yourself on when do I need to maybe fall outside of the, my contracted rates. I mean, there are circumstances where you want to be able to capitalize on spot market activity. If you're in a spot market zone, you want to see where spot market uh, activity is increasing or where it's decreasing, and you can start focusing sales efforts or better educate your, your sales team or your operational team on where they need to be moving their, uh, their rates day to day. Because when you're looking at rejections, you're looking at the relationship between both both uh, markets, both buckets, if you will. Absolutely. No, I think you made a really good point. Um, yeah, there, there are the two two sides of things. I want to come back to, I know we're, we're getting here towards the end of time, but let's come back to Sonar real quick. So if we could put the screen back up. So this is back to the volume levels for drive-in in this example. You mentioned this earlier and didn't want us to to leave it. So this is the seasonality. You know, it's great to see that, you know, volume levels are up for drive and freight or really freight it overall um, mm -hmm. from this time last year. But we can see how that compares. So what I've done on this chart, this blue line is the drive and volume levels for where we are basically as of this morning, right? right. So last update. The green line right here is going to be 20 uh, 20s numbers from this time last year. So as you can see, 2019, a lot lower than the blue line. And then the orange line is 2018's levels from right. this time last year. So again, lower. So we're actually higher than we were in 2019 or, and 2018. So from a volume perspective, we're doing pretty well. Yeah, I, it's that same way, almost the same way for Reefer as well. I was looking right. at this um, probably an hour ago or so. Reefer is up over 2019. It is lower than 2018 so far, but overall we're seeing increases in volumes already, and I expect it to maintain that trend over last year. So I think the outlook for the year so far is actually very positive in terms of you know better yeah. for everyone. Awesome, good stuff. Well, well, that's that's fantastic, folks. Thanks for tuning in. We're getting here towards the end of time of Sonar, so we want to go ahead and number one, thank again, Volta Logistics for Mug of the Week. Again, if you want to be a part of the Mug of the Week, feel free to email me. That's elfalaska at freightways.com, and we or leave a comment, and we can go ahead and get you set up. Also, if you're interested in Sonar and you want to see a demo and you want to dive in deep with somebody like me or Brian, probably Brian, he's a lot better at this than I am, you can go ahead and scan that QR code down in the bottom right corner of your screen. Very easy. We'll get you set up. Request that you want to talk to somebody, and we'll get you taken care of. Also, next week, we've got a very special guest coming to Sonar, so be sure to tune in. They are an active Sonar customer, awesome. and they will be showing us how they're using Sonar and the things that they're using to basically profit themselves, especially in this market, like we've said, with rates going down, but volumes going up. So it's very exciting. Tune in tomorrow, or next week, excuse me, and you'll get to see what they have. Brian, thank you for joining me again. Pleasure. Dude. I'll see you next week, right? Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Man. Good stuff. And thank you again, Cody, for the uh, backdrop. It's great. We love it. It's awesome. Folks, have a great evening. We'll see you next week.